Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we would look at the fault risk and bond ratings. Those topics are covered on the CPA BEC section as well as the CFA exam. FarhatLectures.com is a website that's going to supplement your CPA preparation as well as your accounting and finance courses. Please check it out. LinkedIn is where you will need to connect with me if you haven't done so. YouTube, please subscribe to my channel. I have 1,800 plus accounting, auditing, finance, tax, as well as Excel tutorial. If you like my lectures, please like them and share them. If they benefit you, it means they might, they might benefit other people. Share the wealth. Connect with me on Instagram and Facebook. And this is my website, once again, farhatlectures.com, to supplement your accounting and finance, as well as CPA preparation. Let's talk about bonds. And we can break the bonds into two categories. Think of grading. Think of when you take a class, you are giving a grade, either an A, A minus, B plus, C, whatever that grade is. Also, when you borrow money from the bank, each individual will be judged based on their credit score. And this is what we are talking about now. For example, as individual, the highest credit score is 850. So if you have an eight, you know, if you have an 840 credit score, I'm very proud of my credit score. My credit score is above 800. You will get a, a, the best interest rate available that the bank has to offer. Now, bonds go through the same grading procedures. But if you want to break the, 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 bond, the bond rating into two categories, and those will be investment grade, and speculative or junk or high yield grade. So what is an investment grade bond? An investment grade bond is a bond rated triple A and above by S&P or BAA and above by Moody's. So who who who's S&P, Standard & Poor's and Moody's? Those are the rating agencies. Those are not the only one. Those are the biggest one, the most famous one. And what they do is they rate you. They rate your bond, whether it's for example, S&P, they would use triple A. It has the highest quality. And basically, if you're triple A, it means that rated has the highest credit rating, capacity to pay interest, and principal extremely strong. It means if you buy this bond, there's, there's practically no chance of not getting the money and the interest. That's what they're saying. It's very strong. Then you have double A. Double A means uh, has a very strong capacity to pay interest together with the highest rating this group compromise the high grade bond class so you want to be either triple a or double a or moody's they have a and capital and two, uh, lowercase two a's and upper uh, uppercase and lowercase a's just the way they use the rating but they're basically the same thing then you could be a, A, or triple B, or B, which is considered high quality. Again, you could read about what does that mean when they say triple B. Well, is regarding as having adequate capacity to pay interest and repay the principal, whereas it normally exhibit adequate protection parameters, adverse economic condition or changing circumstances are more likely to lead to a weakened capacity to pay interest. So simply put, if you have triple B, there is a, you're not as good as uh, triple B is not as good as triple A. And if you have triple C, then you become what's called speculative or grade or junk bond. So you really want to be, if you want to be investment grade, you want to stay in these two categories. Now, speculative grade or junk bond, a bond rated double A or lower by S&P is considered uh, or lowered by Moody's. Those are considered speculative or junk bond. So here's speculative or junk bond. Now, why that's why is that important? That is important because if you are speculative or a junk or junk bond or high yield bond, what's going to happen is the company that ha that that is rated that way, their bonds is rated that way. They have to pay higher interest cost because if you are going to be investing in those bonds, you need to be compensated. It means for the company that's a higher cost, that's more expenses, that's lower profit. OK, but the investor, the lender, they want to be compensated for that risk. Now, the speculative bond uh, before 1997, all almost all bonds were falling angel. Falling angels mean to get to this junk status, you were before investment grade. OK, bond issued by the firm had originally had an investment grade. Then their situation deteriorated and they went from this category to this category. OK, however, 
firms began to issue in 1977 original issue junk bond. Now, starting in 1977, what happened is companies started to issue junk bond. Okay, so much of the uh, much of the credit of this innovation is given to a firm called Drexel Berman Lambert, and especially its trader, a guy named Michael Milken. And if you have time, I suggest you Google him or YouTube him and to learn a little bit more about him. So firm not, not able to muster an investment great were happy to go to Drexel and what they did is they raised money for them through those junk bonds so f right from the get-go your bond was speculative okay so eventually what happened high yield bond were very famous in the 1980s and they were used to finance leverage buyout and hostile takeover between companies but what happened eventually drexel the, the firm and michael milken they get they ha they they went into trouble they they get into trouble on Wall Street from an insider trading scandals, and the junk uh, the junk bond market was kind of they they were associated with that market. So when they went to jail, kind of it lost a little bit of steam. Then it came back later. But I suggest if you're interested in this, just YouTube or watch a documentary about this topic. It's very interesting, an interesting personality, Michael Milken. Um, but it's beyond the scope of this recording but you could uh, check him out yourself so how do how do rating agencies determine whether a bond is a triple a double a or triple c well they look at they look at certain financial indicators what are those some of those financial indicators now we're going to look at few it doesn't mean those are the only one but those are um, important ones first they look at the with something called the coverage ratio and we're going to learn about those later on when we look at our uh, financial statement analysis. We'll look at these ratios, but we're gonna cover them briefly here. It's the ratio of companies' earnings to fixed assets. So how much earnings do you have in comparison to, to your fixed, not asset, to your fixed cost? Usually, what is your fixed cost? Like the main thing in your fixed cost is interest because interest is a fixed cost. So how much are you earning comparing to your fixed cost? One, one specific example will be something called the times interest earned and basically what what that is it, they will take your interest and um, your income before interest and taxes so they will take the ratio of your income your earnings before interest and taxes so e b i t your in earnings e for earnings so your income before interest and taxes and you'll divide this by your interest expense by i so let's assume you have earnings of ten dollars and your interest expense is two it means we say your coverage is five now if another company has an earning of 20 and interest of two their coverage is 10 it means they can cover their interest expense 10 times you can cover your in interest expense five times so obviously the higher this ratio the better off you are low or falling coverage ratio signal possible cash flow difficulties now that's not the only coverage ratio but that's one of the most famous one your earnings before interest and taxes also they could look at something called the leverage ratio and there are a lot of leverage ratio but we're going to be looking at debt to equity now let's let's see what this is a high leverage ratio indicate excessive indebtedness raising the possibility of the firm will unable to earn enough to satisfy its obligation and this ratio is very easy to explain because as as it as it treats debt to equity so take your debt so if you have debt of if you have debt of 30 and you have equity of 10 which is <laughs> let's see th 30 divided by 10 is 3 this is your debt to equity what, what does that mean if we have debt of 30 and equity of 10 as an accountant assets equal to your debt plus your equity it means you have assets of $40 of which $30 coming from debt and $10 coming from equity it means you are highly leveraged so for every dollar the investors bring in you are using three dollars from the lenders yeah, investors would love this. They're risking one dollar. The the debt holders are risking three dollars. So if you have high debt to high debt to equity ratio, you are simply a risky company. Because what's happening is you are using the lender's money. So the, the shareholders, they're putting one dollars. You're bringing three dollars from the bondholders or from the bank or from the lenders. It's a very risky endeavor. And think about it. If you are a stockholder if you own this company the maximum you would lose is a dollar they would use three so you are highly leveraged you may take excessive risk so it's a high 
it's a high uh, it's a high risk endeavor another type of ratio again we'll talk about those ratios later on this is just kind of to tell you what what indicators they look at they look at liquidity ratios what is liquidity ratios the two most common one it's the one that you learn the first two ratios are the current ratio and its cousin the quick ratio and basically what is the current ratio taking your current assets dividing your current assets by your current liabilities so if you have current assets of 20 current liabilities of 10 we say the ratio of two it means for every dollar in current liabilities you are covered two dollars in current assets now you want this to be as high as possible but you don't want it to be too high because you don't want your assets to be tied into current liabilities because current liabilities don't earn a lot like if you have cash in the bank cash don't earn you a lot of money the related or its cousin, the quick ratio, basically the quick ratio is taking your current assets, excluding inventory, and specifically not only excluding inventory, you ex exclude accounts like supplies, prepaid, small, small current assets. Basically what you keep is your cash. When you come to the, when it comes to the coverage, the quick ratio, you'd only use cash investments short-term investments and account receivable and you'll divide those by current liabilities basically it's similar to this one except you will take the inventory out simply put what you are saying is let's assume my inventory is useless can i still pay off my liabilities that's what you're saying so obviously always 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 the quick ratio for any particular company is lower than the lower than the uh, the quick ratio is lower than the current ratio because remember what you're doing is you are removing from the twenty dollars but you are not removing from the ten dollars so you are removing numbers from the numerator which is current assets but not from the denominator another again I'm going to say, I don't want to keep repeating this, but we'll talk about those later. Profitability ratios measures the rate of return on your assets or equity. So simply put, how much money are you earning in relationship to your assets? How much money are you earning in relationship to the equity, to the shareholders? Okay, the profitability ratio is an indicator of the company's overall overall performance. Of course, you want the profitability ratio to be high. You want to be making a profit to be a good company. If you're making a profit, guess what? Then you can pay off your debt. If you can pay off your debt, we're going to give you a good credit rating. Just like if you have a job, you're paying off your debt, you're going to have a better credit score. So return on asset, which is earnings before interest and taxes divided by total asset. And we'll explain later why it's earning before interest and taxes and return on equity. Same thing. You'll take a net income dividing by equity. Those are two, the two most popular measures. There are other profitability ratios, but those are the two most popular measure. Firms with higher re uh, return on asset or equity should be able to better raise money in security market before they before they offer prospect for better return on the firm investment of course if you are making a profit you want to borrow money you are less risky because you are making profit the lenders are not worried about your credit risk so they are willing to lend you the money and they're willing to lend you the money at a lower at a lower interest cost and cash flow to that ratio i believe that's the most accurate or the best one to cover to not to cover to look at is looking at your cash flow to debt so tell me how much cash do you have to cover your debt? I mean, all the others are good, but at the end of the day, you pay your debt with cash. So what is your cash flow in relationship to your debt ratios? I want to see that. So those are five important indicators. And here they, ha you know, here, for example, uh, you can you can see them side by side. For example, here, they're, 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 they're looking at earning before interest and taxes. Uh, divided by total assets and for a triple a company it's 20.9 for example um, for double a company it's 15.6 so you want this ratio to be high here the profitability notice the triple a they have they have good asset coverage they they have good good profit margin ratio they have a good uh, interest coverage multiple ebit to interest coverage debt to earnings before interest and taxes multiple they're all high that to uh, that to equity you don't want it to be high so this is low which is good you want it to be low the others high funds from operation to total debt so this is high as well so notice retained cash flow in relationship to your uh, to your debt this is high so notice if you compare those triple a figures for these ratios to these as your financial situation deteriorated guess what then your credit rating will go down. For example, if you're operating margin, operating profit margin, you're only making 8.9, 8 well, you're not going to be graded as AAA because the AAA company is making profit for every dollar in sales. They're making 22% in profit. Uh, 
Here, triple A, their debt to equity is only 19 per 19% here. Your debt to equity is 72. And here for C, practically dollar for a dollar for every dollar in debt you have, for every dollar in equity you have a dollar in debt so this is how you know this is how in other words this is how or this is what those s p and moody's look at when they evaluate the credit ratings of the companies they look at ratios like these let's look at more terms that deals with bonds and credit rating one of them is indenture and basically what is an indenture simply put it's a contract between the bondholder and the issuer why because if something happens you need to spell out we need to find out who's going to be paid first and how and if there's any collateral so so the bond indenture it will spell out it will spell out the uh, the the uh, the uh, the specific conditions between the bonder and the between the bondholder and the lender because things will happen and sometimes you'd have two bondholder who's going to get their money first well we're going to deal with that shortly but this is why you have to spell out what are the what is the contract what does the contract says we have something called the sinking fund it's a bond indenture that calls for the issuer to periodically repurchase some proportion of the outstanding bonds prior to maturity and basically a bond indenture um, basically it's a contract the sinking fund it's part of the indenture it basically what it's saying it's saying look don't wait until all the bonds mature all at once you might have to come up with a lot of money why don't you create a sinking fund what is a sinking fund put some money away in a fund let it sink in other words put it away from everything else and start to buy those bonds periodically so the firm will will may repurchase a fraction of the outstanding bonds in the open market each year why so they don't have to pay all the bonds all at once when they come mature so the firm have the option to purchase the bonds at either at the market price or sometimes they have a sink in fund price if there's a sink in fund price obviously you will buy it based on the lower of the two so to allocate the burden of the sinking fund called fairly among bondholder, the, the bonds chosen for the call are selected at random based on serial number. So because which bond are you buying? Well, you would so randomly select them because think about it. Some people want, you know, to redeem their bond. So they will be happy to give you back the bond and give them back their money. But the sinking fund bond differ from, you remember we talked about the callable bond? A differ between uh, between the callable bond in two different ways the firm can repurchase only a fraction of the bond not everything sometime they allow them to double in some contract they would say we might be able to buy 10 percent and under certain circumstances buy 20 percent of the bond that's first thing so you cannot buy everything also callable bond when you have a callable bond the callable bond has a premium cost in other words the company will pay more than the par value for the bondholder the sinking fund bond usually they're set at par value they're going to give you exactly what the par value is let's take a look at additional terms that are relevant to bond rating a subordinated of further debt what does that mean now think about it one of the factors that determine the credit riskiness of the company is how much debt you have because the more debt you have the worse off you are if you think about it now what's going to happen is to prevent firms from harming bondholders subordination clauses restrict the amount of their additional borrowing so they would say okay if you want to borrow more they would say okay you can borrow more but if in case anything happened we are paid first okay so additional debt might be subordinated in priority to existing debt so they would say okay if you want to borrow would we'll let you borrow they will put that in the indenture but if something happened we get paid first so in the event of a bankruptcy subordinated or junior debt holder will not be paid unless the senior debt holder is paid in full and this makes sense i want to protect myself i gave you the money first therefore i have a priority in case something happened also a uh, bondholder to protect themselves they might put what's called dividend restriction in the covenant okay so those are covenant limiting dividend protect bondholder because they force the firm to retain assets rather than pay them out to stockholders now think about it think about it from the stockholders perspective the stockholders they want you to pay every single penny out in profit in dividend because that's their company the bondholders on the contrary they don't want you to pay anything out in dividend because they want to keep the money so you pay you pay back the interest plus plus the bond you pay back the interest plus the bond so a typical restriction would this allow bond payment of dividend if cumulative dividend paid since the firm inception exceeds cumulative retained earning plus the proceeds of the sales of the stocks so they will put something like this and this is just an example of a restriction well once you paid once you have paid dividend equal to the profit 
you know, it equal to the cumulative retained earning, which is the cumulative the cumulative profit over the years plus the sale of the stock. So simply put, once you distributed all your profit and you distributed uh, enough dividend to cover the sale of the stock, we don't want you to pay dividend anymore. Also, bondholder might have might request collateral. So some bonds are issued with specific collateral behind them. For example, well, in case you could not pay me, you have to sell your building or you have to sell your warehouse or you have to sell part of your inventory. That is a collateral. It's a particular asset that's pledged against that bond. And obviously, if you have a collateral as a bondholder, you are better off because if something happened, you will be paid. Okay. Sometimes they're called mortgage bond, collateral or mortgage bond. In contrast to the venture, what are the venture? Guess what? You're really in big trouble when you have a debenture as a bondholder because you are not backed by any specific collateral. So when you give them the money and they say this is a debenture bond, guess what? It means you have no protection whatsoever. So good luck if something happened. You have no assets to back up uh, to to uh, to back up the bond. Let's talk about yield to maturity and default risk. So obviously, default risk means what? You know, c corporation might be subject to default. It means at some point they may not pay you the money. So we must distinguish. So when you buy a bond between the bond promised yield to maturity and its expected yield, those are two different things. Yield to maturity and expected and expected uh, yield. The promise or the stated yield will be realized Simply put, if they're promising 8%, well, you're going to earn 8% if the firm meet the obligation of the bond. Simply put, if they promise you 8%, that's the maximum you will earn if they pay you the bond, because this is how much you earn. Now, this is the promise or the stated yield, which is technically is based on the coupon. The expected yield to maturity, this is expected. Notice, this is what you were promised based on the stated yield. This is the expected. The expected is, must take into account the possibility of a default. What does that mean? It means, well, guess what? You may not get your money at the end of the day. So what is your yield? What's your expected yield under those circumstances? Let's work an example to show you how this works. So for example, at the height of the financial crisis in October 2008, I still remember that very vividly here, Ford Motor Company struggled in its 6.625 coupon. So they have a coupon and it's paying 6.625. Okay, and it's due in 2028, and they were rated triple C, which is a very low credit rating. And they were selling about 33% of par value. It means they were selling at a discount. And if you bought those bond, if you if you bought those bond at 33% discount of their value, you would have your yield to maturity, which is 20%. This is excellent. Here, here's the trick: when the yield is too high. Why is the yield too high? The yield is too high because the bond is discounted. So they're paying 6.625. That's a high coupon. It's not only a high coupon. The bond went down in price. The, the bond went down in price. Therefore, you would earn 20%. But the problem with these bonds is what a Ford Motor Company is, is not in existence in 2028 when they become due. Now, luckily, Ford did survive. And the reason why Ford survived, that's a different story because right before the financial crisis, <laughs> Not because the CEO is smart, just they happen to have to, to refinance everything and they have cash on hand. Therefore, they survived the financial crisis in contrast to GM. But if you bought those bonds, well, although they promise 6.625, your actual, your expected would have been 20%, which is a great deal, a great deal. So bonds become more subject to default risk when the price is false. So you have to be very careful when you're looking at a bond and the bond has a high yield. The reason why you would have a high yield is because there's a good chance that the bond is down in price. The reason it's down in price is because it's not credit worthy. So you have to be very careful with those bonds. So suppose a firm issued a 9% coupon bond for 20 years. And let's assume the bond had 10 years left until it, if it mature. But the bond is having some financial difficulties. Well, here the investors believe that the firm will be able to make good on the remaining interest payment but at, at maturity. It will be forced into bankruptcy and the bondholder would receive only 20%. Okay. So I'm sorry, not 20%. They would receive, they would receive uh, 70, 70%. 70 so, so the bond right now is selling at $750. So rather than a thousand, basically it's discounted to $720, $750. Now yield to maturity, that's going to change. That's going to change. So here's what's, here's what's going to happen. It pays 9% coupon. It means $45. $45 a, a payment. The remaining life is 20 years and 20 years. The stated 
yield to maturity we have to use a thousand dollar because that's what's what that's what it's stated and the price right now is 750 now we have to compute i so if we compute i the stated yield to maturity which is based on the promised payment is 13.7 based on the expected payment which is here expected ytm you only you would yield 11.6 percent so the stated yield here is greater than the yield investors actually expect to earn so, so if we look at the numbers basically what you have to do just go to the financial calculator and input the payment pmt equal to 45 the pay, uh, the number of payment n equal to 20 the final payment is the future value and the price is a pv negative 750 and compute the uh, uh, compute i and it's going to give you the it's going to give you the uh, yield it's going to give you the yield suppose the condition of the firm and uh, uh, deteriorate further and the investor now believe the company will pay only 55 per 55 percent so simply put what you do as you take this price and now you're getting only 550 dollars 55 percent if we compute this now the now the stated yield to maturity based on the promised cash payment is 15.2 while the expected yield to maturity increased by 0 0.04 the drop in price caused the promised yield and the default premium to rise by 1.5 percent very very interesting let's take a look at uh, the default premium the co to compensate for the possibility of default corporate bond must offer a default premium and what is a default premium it that's the difference between the yield on the corporate bond and the yield of otherwise risk-free or identical government that's riskless in terms of default so so if i want to buy a corporate bond well guess what I want to make sure I'm going to be earning more than what I would pay for the U.S. Treasury or Treasury bond. Why? Because the Treasury bond has zero interest, it has zero credit risk. If I'm, if I'm going to be buying your bond, I need to be compensated. That extra compensation is the default premium in case something happened. I, I want to be compensated. So if the, if the firm remains solvent and actually pay the investors all the promised cash, Guess what? I'm going to get a higher return than if I if I put my money with the government because I am taking a higher risk. Well, if however the firm goes bankrupt, the corporate bond is likely to provide a lower return than the government. Simply put, you're going to lose your money and this, this is why you would get a lower return. So the corporate bond has the potential for both a better or worse performance than a default free treasury bond of course when you lend money you are taking risk it's not as risky as buying stocks but it's, it's riskier than the treasury bond the government uh, giving your money to the government so in other words it's riskier of course it is of course it is uncle sam is the safest well we can say that so far so hopefully let's let's hope we will stay it will stay that way otherwise we'll have an armed again we'll have a big we'll have a big problem who knows so also we have something called the, the risk structure of interest rate which is the pattern of the fault premium offered on risky bond this is called the risk structure of interest rate and what happened is this the greater the default risk the higher the default premium of course let's take a look at those different types of bond high yield bond triple b bond and uh, triple a bond so tr notes the triple a bond the yield from the 70s it doesn't differ that the, so they don't have to pay a lot of risk premium why because they're already notice they're already close to zero so they don't go that far but if we're looking at a high yield bond high yield bond when when the situation deteriorate when the economic when the, when we have an economic problems to buy those bonds you're going to have to pay they're going to have to offer a premium to for the investors to buy them so notice the yield spread is very very high why because they are riskier they are riskier um credit default swaps or cds those are a form of insurance policy on the default risk of a bond or a loan so what you do is you buy them so if you have a bond you buy them you'd say okay in case something happened to my bond someone will pay me so if you want to invest in at&t bonds and you invest in AT&T bond and what you do at the same time you buy insurance from someone else from a bank from an investment company and they would agree and you'll pay them a premium just like any insurance it would be called credit default swap and basically what happened is if AT&T don't pay you back the money they will pay you back the money so the annual premium and you can buy this on bonds government bond or or uh, sovereign bond which is uh, government or and um, or corporate so the annual premium in early 2010 on a five years sovereign greek bond was about three percent meaning to, if you have a uh, 
a bond principal of $100, you have to pay $3. That's 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 a little bit expensive. So the CD, CDS seller collect the annual payment for the term of the contract, but must compensate the buyer for the loss of the bond value in the, ev in the event of a default. So you're taking a now a lot of companies don't did not think they were taking a big risk when they sold when they sold those credit default swap in the 2008 financial crisis because they never thought that those bonds would collapse but those bonds eventually collapse so cdc contract on corporate as well as they're available for sovereign debt and back then they, they did not have credit default swaps on mortgage-backed securities so if you watch the big short or if you read the book they went to the investment bank and they tried to convince them to write those uh, credit default swaps uh, while cdc were conceived as a form of bond insurance that's the original purpose of them it wasn't long before investors realized they could use them as speculative so simply put what you're doing is like you're buying uh, fire insurance on your neighbor's house that's that's basically what they are because if something happened to your neighbor's house if something happened to the bond you will be you will be paid that's basically how it works so if we look at john paulson who predicted the imminent financial crisis purchased those cds contract on mortgage bonds and actually they did not exist yet to convince investments banks and banks to sell them those as well as that of financial firms that would have profited as their cdc prices spiked in september right before the crisis so his bearish bet because he knew those bonds gonna go go, go bad made his firm 15 billion he got 3.7 billion by doing this bet this is you know again watch the big short or read the book in the next topic we would look at yield curve again i would like to invite you to like this recording share it and don't forget to visit my website farhatlectures.com for additional resources for this course and other courses good luck study hard and stay safe.